doesn't believe the kids will lose their salvation. It just means they can't have enough somewhere to come for church. So I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you, I don't know if you realise that's what he said, but uh, just to cover that. But uh, I'm Brother Lane Kelly, missionary in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, we are glad to be witches, so happy to be here. And uh, I know the two men, and I know you have some Haitian people in your church. So the two boys are coming back on Wednesday. Yeah. And uh, you will get to hear Brother St. Pierre on Wednesday. So uh, they were great at singing. Uh, so well done, man. And his DVD video normally isn't like that. <laughs> it's normally really good and it plays really quick. Um, but um, sometimes these things happen. Okay. So I'm missionary Lane Kelly in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, I, I have a ministry reaching addicts. So if you look at my prayer card uh, at the back of the church, Get my prayer card. You will see my family on the prayer card. I am married to Claire Kelly. Uh, normally we get a laugh because the guys will get up and say, I'm the husband of one wife, um, but I only have one wife. And uh, I have five boys, uh, all Irish names. And if you can name my children and get the names right, you will get something off me, okay? So uh, that's the little competition at every church we go to. But I'm missionary Lane Kelly of Dublin, Ireland, working with LifeGate Bible Baptist Church. And uh, I reach addicts and uh, homeless people, that kind of stuff. That's my focus. I'm uh, working with the Church of LifeGate. I run a Reformers Anonymous program for anybody that might know what that is. And uh, I started a Force Reformers Anonymous Bible Based Addictions program in uh, Europe. And I've started three more in independent Baptist churches uh, in the UK and Ireland as well, working with churches there. And I run a, a discipleship home uh, which houses 25 men. So I teach and train uh, guys that are coming from a background of drug, a drug and alcohol addiction. We house them where they're not allowed to leave, so they're in a full-time residential discipleship program. We keep them for a year. I get lots of preachers from um, that are American missionaries that are in the area uh, to come in and help teach and stuff like that. So we see guys from all over the UK and Ireland come in and they stay with us for the year. We do 19 hours of Bible classes a week. And um, we have a work program and they're at church every time the doors are open. Uh, it's a wonderful way of reaching men. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Ireland before I start preaching. But uh, Ireland is a, it's a, a strange place. It's a lovely place. It's green, as you can imagine. And uh, it rains a lot. Um, but from a, a religious point of view, it is 80% Catholic. 20% don't believe in God, and you have a, a couple of people, a few thousand people maybe, that would claim to be born again. So in Ireland, you only have 21 independent Baptist churches in the whole country, servicing 4.7 million people. Wow. Okay? That's 21 independent Baptist churches in the whole country. With a total membership of just over 200, and I think it's 238 members in the entire country. Okay, we've done a survey over the past year uh, of the churches, and that's the numbers that are in the churches. Um, now of all the churches, um, only one owns its own building, and only one supports its own pastor. Okay, so that tells you what kind of churches they are. They're small missions churches started by American preachers coming over, trying to reach the Irish people, which we're very grateful for. My own church was started by an American missionary nearly 40 years ago. That came over, dedicated his whole life to the Irish people, and uh, is still in Ireland. And yeah. my pastor is one of the guys that he reached when he came. So my pastor is David O'Gorman, an Irish uh, preacher. And uh, I work alongside David O'Gorman, uh, and I head up the outreach ministries, uh, reaching addicts, um, and it goes really, really well. It's hard to reach Irish people. They are, they are Catholic, or else they have been turned off the Catholic Church but if you put a gun to their head, they will say they're Roman Catholic, that everybody in Ireland is born or born Roman Catholic normally. Um, so you say, how did I become a missionary? Well, I, uh, I grew up Roman Catholic, and uh, I got saved at Holiday Bible Club or Vacation Bible School when I was 12 years of age. And I would love to say the rest of my testimony from then to now has been as a church kid, and I've grown up and, uh, and done right all my life. But the sad story is, that is not my story. My story is I got saved in Holiday Bible Club. God done a work in my life. I heard the gospel, went forward, and uh, uh, was in church for about a year after that or so. 
and uh, and doing all the stuff that uh, church kids should do and would do. And uh, then when I was uh, coming from the end of middle school to high school, I got in with the wrong crowd, left church, never went back, and um, went through all the different, I suppose, drugs that's out there. I ended up becoming a drug addict. So I've taken everything from um, start drinking alcohol, stealing cars, taking ecstasy, amphetamines, LSD, cocaine, until as a young teenager, me and my friends on Halloween night uh, tried a drug called heroin, and I ended up becoming a heroin addict for many years of my life. Um, and it ruined me. I grew up in a broken home, my dad was gone, and I suppose fitting in with the crowd was meeting a need in my life. I wanted to be loved. I wanted to fit in. I wanted to feel part of something. I wanted to feel part of the crowd. And these older boys that I hung around with, I found that in them. And, uh, and But I was doing lots of risky stuff to be their friend. And I ended up becoming a heroin addict. It really stripped me of every bit of, I suppose, self-respect you might have. And um, got addicted to heroin in that. Went so far as to end up I was injecting heroin. Uh, I've done everything that an addict can do. Okay, I've sold drugs, I've stolen, I've cheated people, I've done all sorts of stuff. I've broken my mommy's heart, and uh, everybody tried to help me, and nobody could help me. Until one day I walked through the doors of that Baptist church again. The preacher took me into live in his home and detoxed me off heroin in his house with him and his family. And um, and God used that man in my life to show me that God is real and he can change anybody's life. And this is how I got into, I suppose, reaching addicts, because I used to be one. And the thing is, God can take any of our old sinful life and use it for his glory. And there's, there's, there's addicts that are out there on the street that you mightn't be able to reach, that God can use me to reach. Um, because I've been there, I know what it's like, and uh, I know how it feels, I know the shame and guilt that comes with it. But you know what? If you went to my church this morning and our services today, you would have seen her ex heroin addicts in the choir. You would have been shown to your seat by guys that used to be crack cocaine heads, and they would have ushered you to your chair. You know, so uh, God has done a great work in, in Ireland and reaching Irish men through a ministry like ours and getting them plugged into church. Um, so, preacher sent me across to live on a farm in Scotland, Christian farm, to get some discipline in my life, learn, get a work ethic, get to walk closer with God. So I went over there in the year 2000, and uh, I, uh, I, I, I suppose, was terrified going, but preacher thought it was a good idea, so I done what he said, and I went. And uh, I finished the program there, done really well. God had changed my life, changed the way I thought, changed my outlook on life, changed everything uh, that, um, every way I reacted even, because I started getting my head into this thing. Mm -hmm. This is a Bible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And this will change our life. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But uh, I joined the local Baptist church when I was finished on the farm. I had to go to church with the farm people when I was there. But when I finished the program, I joined the local Baptist church. And really long story short, I married the preacher's daughter. That's clear. That's how I met my Scottish wife, okay? I always married that at the top, okay? Um, and I married the preacher's daughter. And um, lived in Scotland, no intention of moving back to Ireland. Got a job. Claire was finishing her studies. Uh, you know, I was working with a bot an apartment and stuff like that, no plans to move back to Ireland, came to a missions conference and the Lord quite clearly dealt with us about giving up what we had, that life that I always dreamt of having, God wanted me to give it up and move to Ireland and reach addicts. Um, so that's what we done in 2005, I went into the ministry full time, gave up my job, gave up my, my house, moved from Scotland to Dublin, Ireland, and uh, start working at LifeGate Bible Baptist Church. And uh, we've been there ever since. And uh, I raise support in the churches in Ireland and the UK. They're very small churches. And I suppose there's nowhere else to go over there for support. So that's why I ended up having to come and try raise support for my family uh, over here. So that's how I ended up in your church tonight, working with health ministries. And they've been a support and a help to us getting us uh, the means. So we greatly appreciate that. But we're, we're wanting to, to do a bit of preaching because I, right now, 
If I stick to the time, I know how much I have. Uh, grab your Bible and turn to the most famous passage on missions that there is in the Bible, the book of Judges chapter 3. <laughs> okay. For those of you who know anything about missions, you're not going to find it in, in Judges chapter 3 until tonight. Judges chapter 3, if you will, with me. One of my most famous, uh, our favorite stories in the Bible. The book of Judges is a wonderful yeah. book, full of action-packed stories. I have five kids, and they're all boys. So when I'm doing Bible stuff with my kids, it needs to be action-packed. There needs to be an assassination in it, or there needs to be some kind of scale and wall and <laughs> doing stuff. Uh, you know, that's what they want to see. So you're going to have to listen quick as I speak really fast. You ready? We're in verse 12. We're going to read down. The Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and he went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, eighteen years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerah, a Benjaminite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. Verse 16, if you got lost. But Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length. And he did gird it under his raiment upon his right toy. And he brought a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to the offer of the present, he sent away the people that fear the present. But he himself torn from the quarries that were by Gilgal. And he said, I have a secret message unto thee, O king. Who said, keep silence? And all that stood by him went out from him. And Ehud came unto him. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in his summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee, and he rose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand, and took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed in upon the blade, so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. And the dirt came out. So, wonderful, wonderful story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful story in the Bible uh, great story so if we're starting off on verse 12 you look at verse 12 what does verse tell us verse 12 tell us about God's people the children of Israel the children of Israel did evil the next word's more important again they done evil again you know God's people fall into sin over and over again the Bible says a just man fall it seven times and rise it up again uh, Bible also says, as a dog returneth to its vomit, so a fool shall return to his folly. You know what? We don't. When we get saved, we don't become perfect. The the walk or the the the, the pathway of sanctification can take a long time. Uh, and what we need is we need God working in our lives. The children of Israel, they were God's people, and they did evil in God's sight. So what did God do? Well, God's a loving Father, so He sent. Uh, he raised up the king of Moab, Eglon. And, uh, and some other people to go against his own people to draw them back to himself. And sometimes God's going to have to make you desperate for him in order for you to turn back to him. Amen. You know, that's what he done with the prodigal son uh, in, in Luke 15. He, he made things hard for him. It was no coincidence that a famine started in the land and he began to be in want. That's right. You know what? God can turn your situation when you're away from him to the place where you've nowhere else to go but God for help. I deal with people every day of my life, uh, you know, who are at the end of themselves. They have ruined themselves. They have ruined their kids. They have ruined their lives. They're maybe homeless. They're crack addicts. They're heroin addicts. That you know, they've they've done everything that you could do. They're coming out of prison, whatever it might be. And it looks like there's no hope, but with God, there's always hope. That's right. But you know what? You need to get desperate because that's what the children of Israel done. They got desperate. They cried unto the Lord, and the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud the son of Gera, a Benjaminite. This is the fourth point: a man left-handed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You say, well, why does the Bible put in that he was left-handed? Can anybody tell me whether Peter was left-handed or right-handed? Paul, John, Mark. Yeah. Do. No, no, no. Jesus himself? I reckon he could use both hands to do all things. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, we don't know. But in this passage, the Bible tells us that the man was left handed. Well, you know what? He was left handed. Let me tell you, in that culture, if you grew up, everybody was right handed. You fought with your sword in your right hand. You ate with your right hand. You shook hands with your right hand. If you went and you, you were, uh, shook hands with somebody with your left hand, 
that would be a total disgrace for them. You know why? Because you use your right hand for everything else and your left hand for wiping yourself after you use the restroom. So that's, that was the cultural fact of what was going on. So he was left-handed. Can you imagine when he went to school with his Spider-Man lunchbox under his arm or his jam sandwiches, and he's sitting there at the school desk eating his sandwiches with his left hand? Them kids would have given him a torrid time. You see, Ehud had a disability. In the eyes of the world, he looked like he would never amount to anything. He was different. He looked like an absolute failure, couldn't even use his right hand. Nobody would have respected him when he was growing up. But you know what? God had a plan for that man's life. Sure. God needed a left-handed man. And you mightn't think you can do anything for God. You mightn't think you can win people for God. You mightn't think you can make an impact when we're talking about reaching the world with the gospel. But you know what? God needs people just like you and me. And you know what? Nobody ever would have thought when I was a heroin addict walking around with needle marks in my arm that God could ever use me. But God needs left-handed men and women. Yes. And you could be one of them too. Amen. He was a left-handed man. Well, let's look down at, uh, at um, look at verse 7, look at verse 16. He would made him a dagger which had two edges. We'll get to that in a minute. About a cubit length, about a foot and a half long. And he geared under his raiment upon his right toy. You know what? It was important that he was left-handed because if, if he was right-handed, the sword would be on his left toy. The fact that he was left-handed meant the sword was on his right toy. In order for him to get the sword into the king's presence so he could kill him, he needed to get it past the security guards. Because metal detectors weren't invented until a couple of years after this story. <laughs> so he, need, he needed to get that big foot and a half long dagger in past the bodyguards that their sole job was to protect the king. But you know what? God had a plan. That man was left handed. So his sword was on his right toy. So when he was getting checked in, you know where everybody would keep their swords normally? On their left toy. Because they were pulled from their right hand. You know what? So he was able to get a sword into the presence of the king. God always has a plan. Sometimes God's plans a long way down the road. We don't see it. But uh, Eglon was a very fat man. That's the king, King of Moab. How did he get that fat? Well, he got that fat because he had God's children, God's people in slavery for 18 years. Let me tell you, when we're in sin, when God's people are in sin, it makes the world fat. The world gets fat off our lives when we're doing wrong. You know what? When I lived a life of sin, drug dealers got fat off my life. The court system, the people that worked in the court, the pharmacist, the doctor, the solicitors, now, you name it, somebody was always the cigarette company, the alcohol company. Yeah. You know, um, all those people are getting fat out of my life because as a child of God, <clears throat> I was in sin. You know what? When the children of God are in sin, somebody gets fat off their lives. How did Eglon get so fat? He was living off God's people for 18 years. Do you think he ever washed his own chariot? Brought his own dog for a walk? You better, you know, he sent some Israelite out to do it. Because they were in slavery because they were in sin. Uh, and Eglon was a very fat man. Well, let's look down at verse um, 18. It says, when he, would, when he made an end to the offer of the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. One thing you need to get is, when you're going out to give the gospel, you need to be smart. You don't need to know a whole lot, but you need to be clever. If you're going in to give the gospel, you knock on somebody's door, and you're, you're going out solving, and, and you knock on somebody's door, and you're trying to talk to them, you need to be smart about controlling as much as you can the environment that you're in. He would control the environment that he was in. He says, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. And the king said, who said keep silence? He didn't want anybody else to know. He right. was smart. Let me tell you, there's distractions around the place when we're giving out the gospel, and we need as much as we can to limit them. They might be the TV on when you're talking to somebody. It might be the mobile phone. It might be the kids running around. It might be whatever. Sometimes you need to be smart about your opportunity with the gospel lessening the distractions. So you can focus on the main point of what you're there for. So be smart about giving out the gospel. Next point is, look at verse 19. He himself turned again from the courts that were by Gilgal, and he said, I have a secret message unto the O king, who said, keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. You know what? He was smart about it. But then he stood up, and he came unto, unto him, and he was sitting in his summer parlor, which he had himself alone. A quick point about that is, Eglon was a very easy target. You know why? Because he lied around all day in his summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. You'll be busy for God, you'll become an easy target for the devil. Amen. But you know what, that's not the point, that's a different message. <laughs> but uh, he says, uh, Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. You know what, Ehud knew he had a message from God. I wonder do we know that. We have been entrusted with the most precious message from God that's ever been given. Amen. The gospel. 
It's good Amen. news, and it's for everybody. Amen. There's not a low-down, drug addict, homeless guy, murderer, anybody you want to mention that God can't save. That's right. Amen. The gospel is for all. And let me tell you, Ehud knew when he stood up there, he was risking his life. You heard about the, the missionary family, the missionary that got killed in Cambodia, uh, Cameroon, Cameroon uh, last week. Sometimes when you're going to serve God and you're going to give God's message, you're putting your life at risk. Yeah. Not in my country. My country's like here. You give the gospel anytime you want, nobody's going to kill you. But you know what? There are places around the world where missionaries have to go that you're putting your life in your hands when you're going to speak the message. Yeah. Ehud. You know what? He would have had a tar of time growing up, but he was the only man that could get God's message to this, to, to, of salvation for his whole nation. He said of a message from God unto thee. He knew his message. His message was to kill uh, the king of Moab. But you know what? That's not what our message. Our message is salvation is there. It's full and free for everybody, everywhere. It doesn't matter your color. It doesn't matter your country. It doesn't matter where you're from, rich, poor, educated, or you're as thick as a bag of rocks like me. God's salvation is for everybody. Amen. And you know what? You just have to know the message. And um, know your message. Uh, in John 12, 32, the Bible says, Jesus says in his own words, he says, And if I be lifted up uh, from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. You know what? When you're going with the message, uh, speaking for God, when you're going with the gospel message, you're not going with a message of your church, by the way. That's right. You're not going with a message of your preacher, no matter how nice he is. You're going with a message from God to the people. That's right. You're going with a message from God to the people. You are going with God's word to the people. The next point. You have to get out of your seat. Let's look at the next. Let's look at the next bit. Look at verse 20. And he who came unto him, and he was sitting in his summer parlor, which he had from self alone. And he said, of a secret message unto thee, O king. Who said, keep silence. Um... And uh, he arose out, or uh, he would send a message from God unto the He arose out, we see. Do you know what? We're never going to reach the world until we get out of our seat. Yeah. Right. You cannot reach the world from your lazy boy at home. Right. You just can't do it. It would be great if you could, but you can't. Because the command all the time is to go. That's the command, Isaiah 6 8. I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then he said, Here am I, uh, send me. My, uh, Mark 16, 15, familiar verse, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know what? We need to be a going people. Yeah. And if you can't go, you're responsible for sending. That's why we're here. And that's why health ministries is helping evangelize the world. Because we need to go. And you're responsible as a Christian for reaching the world. That's right. not, not just your church. You as an individual have a responsibility from God. The message from God that you have to give to the world is a worldwide message. You need to give it to the world. Yeah. You can do that by going. And if, if you will go, that would be wonderful. But you know what? Not everybody is called to go. And not everybody can go. And if you can't go, and you're not called to go, you send somebody else in your place. And that's what you do when you're given to missions. You are supporting a Haitian man to reach the people in Haitia on your behalf. You are supporting an Irish guy to go reach Irish people in Ireland because you can't go. And, you know, that's what we do. But the message always has to be the gospel. It's not to get people off drugs. It's not to, to educate people. They can be a blessing and a help to bring people to the gospel, but they are not the message from God. Getting somebody off drugs isn't, isn't going to help them in eternity. The message always has to be the gospel. Salvation from somebody's sin. That's where it needs to be all the time. So you have to get out of your seat. Next point. The word of God is the only way to remove the door from somebody's life. You know what? I found this to be a reality in my life. Look at verse 21. And he would put forth his left hand, and he took the dagger from his right eye and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed in upon the blade, so he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. And the dirt came out. Some wonderful, wonderful words there. Bit of savagery, but, um, but that's what the Bible says. 
he would put forth his left hand. What a wonderful thing that is. God used him to get in to kill the king. And you know what? He went and he trusted into the, the king's belly. Well, I want you to know something. See this book? It only has like pages and stuff in it. But I believe it from the book of contents to the book of maps. Okay? Amen. Everything in it is God's word. Right. When it says that Eglon is a very fat man, God put that in for a purpose. Left handed, he put that in for a purpose. The dirt came out, he put that in for a purpose. Everything in here is what we need to know for life and God. Everything that we need to do is in here. Right. This is the thing that makes a difference. This is why the Catholic Church tried to kill everybody that wanted a Bible for years. That's why in my country we don't have Bibles. That's why the first time I saw a Bible was the day I got saved. Because we didn't have them in our church, we didn't have them in our school. You wouldn't find them on, uh, when I was growing up in a hotel. No such thing as Gideon's in Ireland putting Bibles in uh, in hotel rooms. The Catholic Church wouldn't have it. You know, every every school is a Catholic school. Every hospital is a Catholic hospital. You name it, it's Catholic. You know what? We have a book, and Ehud had a sword, and Ehud's sword was a double-edged sword. And um, it was a sword with two edges of about a cubit and about a foot and a half long. And he had it on his right side. But you know what? The Bible calls itself a double-edged sword. In Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint and, uh, joints of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. But you know what? In order for you to get the door down your life, in order for us to help a sinner get the door down his life, we need to get the double-edged sword, just like Ehud did. And we need to go, and we need to trust it into the belly. We need to trust it into our lives. It needs to become part of us. It needs to go all the way in. When Ehud stuck that dagger into the king's belly, it says the half, that's the handle, went in also after the blade, so the fat cl could not close it in after the blade, so he couldn't draw the dagger out of his belly. But you know what? Too many Christians play around, play around with the Bible. They prod and poke their lives at times. They mess around with it and never fully trust it in. It never becomes part of them. It never reaches the inside. It never goes all the way. Because we play a game, it's called Christianity. I mean, we, our game gets played in churches on a Sunday morning, Sunday yes. night, and Wednesday yes. night. And the rest of the week, it's often dusty. But you know what? It's the only thing that could change a life. It's the only, it's the tool that God uses to remove sin from our lives. The door comes out of your life when you put this in. Amen. And the more it goes in, the more clean you will find you'll be. And you know what? As an ex-heroin addict who's done every drug that you can do in every way that you can do it, let me tell you, that's the thing that made the difference. Mm. Applying that to my life made the difference. Look at the end of verse, uh, the end of verse 22. So that he could not draw the dagger out. And the dirt came out. The only way to, uh, to help somebody really is not by educating them. It's not by training them. It's by giving them the word of God, preaching the word of God to them. them getting saved and then discipling them in the word of God so they become Bible-believing Christians. Bible-living Christians. Because you know what Bible Christians will do? They will go. Bible Christians will go. Bible Christians will give. They will go and give the gospel to their neighbor. They will try to reach their friends and family. They will make an impact for the gospel, this good news. They will go with a message from God onto the people. And you know what? That's what we need to be, church. Amen. Friends, that's what we need to be. You know, help ministries, help evangelize lost people. Yeah. You know what? That's an uncomfortable message. It's an uncomfortable message. You know what it means? It means that you're going to have to stand up because it's always, it's better if you stand up when you're giving an offering because you can reach further into your pockets. <laughs> As a missionary, obviously financially, we need support to go and to stay there. But we need people that are actually dedicated to praying. If you can't go, you can be dedicated to praying. And I don't mean, God bless missionaries, and it just becomes a little tag on to your prayer. But you get really serious about God and get a, a prayer card. You maybe don't take all the prayer cards, 
that you're going to diligently pray for. You just ask God to give you a few that you're really burdened about. Places, maybe families that you're really burdened about praying for. And then you go seek God for them. That God would use them to reach the people that they're yeah. called to reach. Yeah. And you know what? Then go yourself. It's so important that you go yourself. If you become a Bible-believing Christian, a Bible-living Christian, uh, it will change your life. And what I would say to you is, I'm just finished. As a Christian, take risks. Yeah. Taking risks yeah. as a Christian yeah. means you will have to depend upon God to do what you have to do. Yeah. Because speaking up for God and going and giving the gospel is risky. It's uncomfortable for us. None of us like to do it. It makes us, we don't want to get rejected. We don't want to feel hurt. We don't want people to think we're strange. But you know what? God uses strange people. <laughs> Left-handed Ehud, he used them. But you know what? Let me give you a couple of quotes up front about the Bible. John Bunyan says, I was never out my book. John Wesley says, I'm a man of one book. <coughs> the Bible says, uh, one in the hand is worth two on the shelf. Uh, and a wise man once told me this. And we're done with this. If you'll make much out of the Bible, God will make much out of you. Amen. I, found, I found that to be true, preacher. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> what a great challenge. Amen. All right. Amen. God has spoken to your